Great. Uh, thank you very much. And first and foremost, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm not a biologist or a taxonomist. I'm actually a, an anthropologist. Uh, and what I'm interested in is the things that uh, people do uh, with biodiversity. Uh, what we see uh, on the screen in front of us is uh, an occurrence map uh, for the species that appear in patent claims in the United States patent collection of 7 million patent documents. Uh, we haven't updated this map to our recent work, but we think it's kind of quite a good illustration of the kinds of things that you can do uh, with GBIF data. So I was invited to uh, speak on the subject of biodiversity and human innovation. And since most of my work is presently about intellectual property, I started to think more broadly about human innovation and would not want to give you the impression that innovation is confined to the patent system. Uh, so I kind of went back to my uh, roots, as it were, which is uh, in the Amazon working with uh, indigenous peoples, notably a people called the Piroa in the uh, Amazon estate in southern Venezuela in the Guyana Shield. I started to think about the way in which people uh, relate with their environment and the way in which they think about their environment and about innovations that come out of this environment. In the case of the Piroa, the mountain you can see in the background there is a uh, the Aitana Tepui, and that is the trunk uh, of the tree of life. It's known as Kawiye. And that tree used to stretch up into the heavens uh, and contained all of the fruits and the plants that uh, the Pira and their neighbors cultivate today. And uh, the before time ancestors of the Pira, uh, who were uh, anaconda, toucan, jaguar, uh, and so on, uh, couldn't get access to these plants. So what they did was they decided to chop down this tree. Uh, and the Autana Tapui is actually flat. It's a little bit obscured uh, by clouds. So we have this jaggedy bit coming up, and then we have the flat top. Uh, and what the Pieroa say is that their neighbors, who were represented by uh, the deer, uh, who was one of the creators who went to chop down the tree, are actually rubbish at chopping down trees. And you can see this by the jaggedy edge, whereas the flat bit uh, is where the ancestor of the Pieroa, the tapir, uh, uh, cut the tree. Now, thinking about this is uh, going down to the slide where you see a small cluster of uh, chaps uh, clustering around a plant. And that plant uh, is best described as the crown of the Awetu. And the Awetu are capricious spirits who uh, attack humans. Uh, and that plant is used by the Pieroa and their neighbors to control menstrual pain uh, in, well, menstrual pain in women. Uh, and in the uh, kind of early 2000s, a group of local biologists became interested in documenting all of the traditional knowledge of the Pieroa and their neighbors uh, with a view to actually making this available to pharmaceutical companies. Now, unfortunately, they failed to mention this to the communities who had quite strongly uh, and strong and firm views uh, about this because what they understood about this plant uh, was based in terms of relatedness between themselves uh, and creator gods uh, in the past. But what I really want to think about here in talking about this is that we need a broad understanding of what innovation is, and we need to think about innovation uh, from the bottom up. So the next challenge, uh, and most of my work has focused on the Convention on Biological Diversity, is, is how do we kind of address issues of scale in thinking about biodiversity and innovation. And to do that, uh, I think the most useful tool for us is actually to think about the uh, patent system. Uh, now, the patent system in the biodiversity convention world is a subject of what could only be described as considerable controversy. Uh, and that controversy has two basic origins. Basically, uh, in the process of the negotiation of the convention, we had uh, a bunch uh, of uh, researchers and others uh, promoting the idea of biological prospecting to uh, identify new and useful plants uh, to promote conservation. It's clearly a very well-intended uh, initiative uh, and in certain respects an important one. We then had another bunch of people who said, well, actually, uh, this is biopiracy. What you're doing is misappropriating genetic resources and valuable traditional knowledge from our countries, uh, submitting that for patent protection and trying to make loads of money out of it. Uh, 
Now, if we start to, one of the problems I had with this debate, uh, and I've sat through that debate for about 14 years now, is, well, where is the actual evidence? We tended to get examples like Neem or Ayahuasca and various others, uh, but where was the actual evidence for what was going on? And this requires uh, engagement with the patent system. And as you will see on this graph somewhere in the mid-1990s, uh, about a million patent applications were filed uh, per year. As of 2012, uh, there are about 2 million patent applications. Uh, we run a database uh, called the World Patent Statistical Database, uh, which contains uh, about 74 million uh, patent applications. So we're dealing with quite large numbers uh, of documents. So the challenge we set ourselves, uh, mainly because I'm a little bit crazy, uh, is how do we actually find the biodiversity uh, in these documents? Now, I uh, work closely with my colleague, Dr. Stephen Hall. He's a very talented programmer, uh, and we uh, gain support to obtain uh, the whole text of the United States uh, Patent Office, the European Patent Office, and something called the Patent Cooperation Treaty, uh, which is important because you can submit an application to the Patent Cooperation Treaty, and that can then go to 143 other countries. So we managed to compile uh, a data set of about 11 million full text patent documents. Uh, and then we contacted uh, GBIF, the Catalog of Life, and so on, uh, and obtained the Global Names Index. Uh, and we drew, I think that's about 17 million variant names, species names, which is good for us because we don't know how people actually use species names in the patent system. Uh, we then reduced that down to about 16 uh, million binomial names uh, and using what St Stephen has described as uh, probably the world's longest regular expression uh, combined with uh, MapReduce and various other approaches. Uh, we used about 400 processors from the uh, Lancaster University high-end computing facility to blast through uh, the 11 million patent documents to uh, find our species. What you see on the, I believe it's on your left-hand side, uh, is, is the raw data coming back. So we have a species match from the document. We have the document identifier, which has to be uh, cross-tested uh, using dates. Uh, then we're able to, you can't quite see it, but we've uh, identified the section of the document. Is it the title, the abstract, the description, or the claims in which the species name appears? And we also have numeric co coordinates for the character position of the start and end uh, of the species name in the uh, data set. Uh, we, uh, it was quite good fun using this high-end computing facility. We, we thought, well, you know, let's just do it. Uh, and it's housed in a building called Mordor, which uh, uh, appealed to us. Uh, but in, in fact, it was actually a bit over the top. Uh, we've recently, uh, since we moved away from the university, uh, used a similar approach by virtualizing machines on three quite inexpensive machines and using new, new parallel to rerun the index uh, with 14 million documents, and it didn't really take that long. Uh, so that just tells us that we don't really need uh, massive computing facilities to do this kind of work. Uh, last year, uh, last November, we published uh, the results uh, of this work in PLOS One. Uh, I'm not going to say this later on, so I'll say it now. Uh, we identified roughly 76,000 uh, full species names, Latin species names, and in the documents from 23,000, well, nearly 23,000 genera. Uh, there were 767,000 documents where we identified species names. We had about uh, 25,000 species names appearing in the patent claims, which is the real substance of a, of a patent document. So uh, I'll come back to, to some of this, but just to give you uh, an idea of the results. We think there's uh, room for improvement. For example, we had a procedure for uh, reconciling uh, abbreviated names. Um, we developed some certainty metrics for that, but we think we've pushed a bit too far on that. And we need to, we've pulled back in our recent work to try and uh, Im reduce the noise levels. Uh, what we can do with this, though, is actually quite important because we can start to actually map out the who, what, and where uh, of patent activity. So we can map out patent trends in terms of applications and grants. I would point out that. Uh, that requires careful interpretation. So one would imagine there was an explosion of innovative activity in 2001 from the blue spike. 
when in fact that is a reporting effect because the United States started publishing patent applications from 2001 onwards. So always be cautious with patent statistics as a lesson from that. Uh, but I think an interesting finding is that uh, on the top right, we can start to see the top species that appear in documents and appear in patent claims. And those are mainly things like maize, it's things like E. coli, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, rice, uh, and Heliobacter pylori, and these kinds of species. And I'll come back to this a little bit later on, but what we've found is that innovative activity is actually very narrowly concentrated around quite a small number of species and that patent applicants tend to display a herd effect. That is to say that if a new species starts to come into the system that is interesting, everybody else starts to jump on it. Um, and this is particularly in, important for the discussions about bioprospecting and biopiracy or misappropriation, because we're tending to find that the species that can originate from a developing country uh, tend to be kind of lower or mid-ranking at most. Unless, as with Hudia Gordoni, somebody actually jumps on this and then you suddenly see it racing up the, the rankings. Uh, we can also see who the top uh, companies are and the technology areas such as pharmaceuticals. Now, one of the issues in uh, debates on uh, access and benefit sharing under the CBD is we have this impression that, that some people, uh, country delegations, let's put it that way, think that a species belongs to them in some important sense. Uh, and what we did in, in this case was we used GBIS uh, distribution data for the species that appear in patents to say, well, let's see where these species appear, that appear in patents uh, actually occur uh, in the world broken down by kingdom. And of course, what we found out was that in the majority of cases, they're very widely distributed species. And there's a certain logic to that because people who were seeking to develop products with particular uh, species or components will probably focus on things that are relatively speaking to hand. Um, now, the mapping dimension of this, I think there's a balancing act actually with this slide because we need to think about uh, plant varieties, we need to think about strains and all of this uh, other variability rather than simply thinking in, in terms of the unit of a species. Uh, in our recent work, uh, we've been focusing on, we've developed six country reports on African countries uh, as part of the ABS capacity building uh, initiative where we were trying to find out, uh, turning biopiracy on its head, I would guess you would call it. And we were trying to find out, well, which species came from these African countries and what are people attempting to do with these species? And then we were saying, well, what insights might that provide uh, African countries with in terms of thinking about uh, community-based uh, development involving uh, these particular plants. So if you like, it's, it's kind of reversing uh, the normal approach to, uh, to looking at patent data. And here we found the GBIF occurrence data. Uh, we have uh, mainly for South Africa and Madagascar, um, and I've just put India up there to demonstrate this, is what interests us about this is two things. Well, as an anthropologist, I'm quite fascinated by the uh, uh, lines that emerge on these maps as the people who are going around doing the georeferencing get out of their cars, wander about a bit uh, and start to code things up to go into the databases. And we see this pattern also uh, elsewhere in Africa and I'm guessing elsewhere in the world with rivers. But it also is interesting if we start to look at, at patent data is this, this georeference data might actually provide us with ideas about communities that might be located near to these particular species, who might make particular uses of those, and to start to think about community-based uh, development that could uh, involve those species, taking into account, of course, uh, conservation issues. Um, we can also break out uh, this data in terms of country reports. So I've just put up a schematic here, a rough schematic on India, focusing on species that appear in patent claims. I won't say much about that, but uh, what effectively this means is by, by indexing the whole lot of uh, the patent records, you're then able to break this down over a set of like, I think it's somewhere over 100 countries we can uh, now report on. Uh, and of course that, you know, the fundamental criteria for that is to actually have the species uh, data available, which is where uh, GBIF has proved to be uh, critical for our work. Now, I've just uh, picked out a selection of um, a few species from the Indian data, uh, such as Boswellia serrata, which shows up uh, quite 
prominently. Uh, I'll just give a couple of examples in view of the uh, time. Um, and I'm never going to remember how to pronounce one of them. Uh, but in this case, this is what we, we see with, with patent data. This is literally what it looks like. And what's attractive about patent data is it's extremely well organized because it's a global system that consists of over 70 million records, almost all of which are electronically available. So this is something to think about when we think about GBF as an electronic data source and the way in which we've conceptual conceptualized our work is actually we're federating different data sources. That's what we're doing, uh, and we're just needing to be careful and think about methodological development in the way that we're doing that. So we can see things like the name, there's extensive classification codes. If, like me, you're a classification code geek, you will actually know what these mean. Uh, and we then have some information that this uh, particular person, uh, which is using Andrographis uh, paniculata uh, for X, Y, or Z purpose in combination with others. Now. In this case, we tend to think about patent activity in pharmaceuticals, but what we have here uh, is developing uh, animal red remedies using uh, uh, herbal remedies, basically, from uh, India and elsewhere. Uh, I'm also quite, going back to this point about um, species occurring in multiple countries, and uh, this is the one I'm never going to get right, I don't think. Uh, particularly as I can't find it, ah, uh, Nothopoditis foetida, which was uh, on the screen earlier. Uh, there's patent activity here uh, that relates to uh, the anti-cancer drug uh, camptothecan, no, sorry, uh, topotecan, which actually comes from uh, Camptotheca acuminata, the Chinese uh, happy tree or cancer tree, as it's known. And what's interesting in this case is the applicant is actually pointing out that this compound actually occurs in two species, one in India and one is in China. And here we are, in the case of our Africa work, we're pointing out, well, these kinds of clues could actually be quite useful uh, for countries in thinking about economic development uh, opportunities. Now, this um, <coughs> could be described as an uh, elaborate uh, reminder note, since as I was departing for India, my wife uh, reminded me that I should uh, obtain some uh, Himalaya herbal moisturizing cream uh, but what interested me about this is if you actually look on the ingredient list on the back of this uh, product you can uh, identify the uh, components uh, both with their Latin names and also with their Sanskrit names uh, and this is a company that's built its uh, brand if you like using Ayurvedic uh, medicine um, and there was a second reason that was also interesting uh, which has now uh, escaped me, other than that I need to remember it. Uh, what also interested me about this is, you know, thinking about community-based approaches, is how do you actually successfully link uh, actual innovation involving biodiversity with meeting people's needs and meeting conservation and sustainable use needs? And so I think there's, there's more of a discussion to be had with companies like this um, in India and elsewhere about these issues. Now, uh, I'm actually doing okay for time. Right, uh, now I'm going to shift away from land-based uh, biodiversity into some work we've, we've just completed and uh, for uh, DEFRA uh, in the UK. Uh, next year, the United Nations General Assembly is going to take a decision on whether to uh, start negotiations of a new implementing agreement on the conservation, sustainable use, uh, and access and benefit sharing for marine genetic resources. So we were um, uh, asked, based on our existing work, to try and work out what is happening in terms of uh, economic activity with marine genetic resources from the deep sea. Now, marine genetic resources from the deep sea, or areas beyond national jurisdiction, uh, are those marine genetic resources that are found beyond 200 nautical miles. Uh, so they're outside of national jurisdictions. Now, um, the first thing to say about this is that the vast majority of activity takes place inside national jurisdictions. Uh, absolutely the vast majority of uh, activity and uh, which was is in a sense obvious but uh, on the other hand it's really useful to actually have some evidence to to demonstrate that that is the case what we've done here uh, on what we tend to refer to in the office as a dotty map which I'm sure is a terribly shameful thing to call it uh, is taken the the GBIF occurrence data for our 
species appearing in patents uh, that occur in the deep sea. And we've actually tried to use the depth records to try and get some kind of profile on this. Uh, so I think the orange color um, is uh, epipelagic, uh, which means zero to 200 uh, meters in depth. Uh, the red is, uh, we just use the term deep sea, which is over 200 meters down to uh, up to about 11,000 uh, meters. And then those with, uh, and then there's quite a lot of data, which I think is the yellowish color, uh, which has no depth data associated with it. Uh, now we were able also to start drawing some trends graphs uh, using uh, the GBIF depth data, and we were quite excited about this until, as I mentioned at dinner last night, I suddenly said, where's the depth data for the bacteria and the archaea? Uh, and all of a sudden, we discovered that there is no depth data for the bacteria and archaea in the GBIF record. And this has a, a, well, for me, it was an alarming consequence that all our bacteria and archaea float up uh, to the epipelagic zone. Uh, so we just can't kind of push to, to get greater clarity on this. Uh, so I've had to write a long, complicated explanation uh, in the report uh, about this. But that's where I think it's, it's a kind of unusual use of, of GBIF data. Uh, and thinking also about the importance both of georeferencing, but also the importance of depth data. So is the UN General Assembly going to go on and negotiate this in the dark, as it were, or can biodiversity informatics actually contribute to informing uh, the debate so that people have a, a reasonable evidence base on which to proceed? Uh, I'm not going to say uh, a lot about these examples, uh, except for uh, Euphasia superba, uh, is of course uh, Antarctic krill, uh, and at least in the UK you can buy krill oil products uh, in boots for about 10 to 15 pounds, and I imagine you can buy them elsewhere in the world. Uh, and there is quite a lot of concern uh, about the conservation, or emerging concern about the conservation of uh, status of uh, Euphasia superba. Um, we have uh, I think it's, uh, I can't quite read it, Alvinella uh, Pompejana, which uh, I will come back to in a minute. But that's actually the source of, uh, it's an Altamonas uh, uh, strain was isolated uh, in association with uh, this uh, marine worm that led to one of the uh, latest uh, anti-cancer drugs from uh, Pharmanar, Ma and I think the uh, compound's called Yondelis. Um, Aquaroa Victoria, uh, well, 2008 uh, Nobel Prize for Chemistry was awarded to, two, uh, to three uh, researchers based on their work on green fluorescent protein, uh, mainly found up, I think, uh, around Vancouver uh, Island Way, uh, and then we'll see what happens next. Ah, yes, this uh, comes back to the Alvanella Pompejana, uh, where I've made a little bit of a, yes, that is correct. Uh, so we get this Abyssin uh, cream. Um, the uh, Altamonas was originally isolated, the strain was originally isolated from a sample at around 2,600 meters uh, off the East Pacific uh, rise. Uh, in this case, we can see Abyssin cream uh, coming from the uh, abyss being used uh, in the marketing. Uh, and I may follow the editor's tip to pair this marine-derived face moisturizer with a matching eye cream uh, later on today. Um, I was, uh, I just need to go back slightly. Sorry, it was, uh, it was the Tunica Actinidae Aeschia tuminata, which was the source of the uh, Yondelis uh, anti-cancer compound. Uh, this, I thought, was a little bit of, of fun. A lot of deep sea marine research seems to really be about bioluminescence, uh, going back to the green uh, fluorescent uh, protein from Aquaroa Victoria. And I think that maybe displays, in part, the herd effect again, in that you find one organism with bioluminescent properties, and so you go and look for the others. Uh, in this case, I thought, uh, C in some cases, we have CSIR in India, uh, using genetic data, uh, also some Japanese researchers to actually try and identify uh, organisms in, in deep sea environments and also to assess uh, the status of the environment down there, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, this little chap, uh, uh, 
Acanthipyra purpurea uh, is pretty interesting because he has a defense bioluminescent defense mechanism uh, again, against uh, Malacosteus niger, and, and both of those uh, appear in patent documents relating to bioluminescent uh, properties. So I think there are some interesting stories that emerge out of uh, innovative activity uh, in uh, this deep sea patent data. But I think we need to, uh, drawing to a conclusion, conclusion think about uh, the limits of innovation. So I think I found it quite sobering after the uh, kind of concern about biopiracy, about enclosure, about misappropriation, uh, and so on, relating to patent data, that roughly speaking, only about 4% of described uh, species actually appear uh, in patent data at all. And that doesn't mean they appear in the claims, that means they appear uh, in the documents, assuming there are about 1.9 million uh, described species. And only about 1% uh, of predicted global species. And I think this was the real sobering message from the research was actually human innovative activity as measured by the patent system is very narrowly concentrated on a narrow range of species. And I don't think, as I discuss at some length in the PLOS paper, uh, that that really serves the long-term uh, human interest when we think about issues such as neglected diseases uh, and food security and so on and how uh, might that be dealt with. So uh, in the PLOS paper, it, it discusses this in more detail, but I was trying to think of, you know, what kinds of strategies might, might be used to improve the situation. So one was to improve taxonomic knowledge, broadly uh, conceived, uh, to include uh, indigenous peoples and citizen science and those kinds of uh, approaches. And the, critically, I think, to improve the basic availability, uh, the availability of basic taxonomic uh, information as an enabling condition for research, uh, in particular for the kind of socio-economic research that uh, we try to do and we try and encourage other people to do. Uh, I think the Nagoya Protocol uh, and arriving at international rules on access to genetic uh, resources and benefit sharing can play a role. And finally, and I think this is quite a, a pretty tough challenge, I think we can uh, need to start rethinking intellectual property and incentives in this area through things like open source approaches and more flexible approaches uh, to intellectual property issues that actually serve people's needs. So, uh, and finally, what I tend to think about when I'm doing all of this is this photo I took of the community where I used to live, of the kids in the community as well. You know, if we are thinking about uh, in biodiversity-based innovations, then really we should be thinking about innovations that service the needs of these actual kids. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I believe we have to physically leave this room in two well, minutes' two time. Minutes. So, so if there's somebody with an incredibly quick question before we have to, and when I mean leave, we have to take all our stuff with us. So does anybody... Oh, here's an incredibly quick question. <laughs> Very quick question. Is there in the databases of the patent system of the world that you examine any indication of whether of the provenance or the original provenance of the materials that were used to elaborate the patent? You have the name, but you don't have a coordinate. Do you? Uh, we've... We've also identified all those instances where a, a country name appears in the patent document in association with a particular species name. Uh, we were trying with another data set of, it's something like globalplacenames.org, something like that, to actually look at place names. But uh, with country names, we're pretty good. But when we start to get into actual place names of cross-referencing from the data, of course, we're, we're hit by a tidal wave of noise is the problem. And we haven't really thought about how else we might deal with that at the moment. Thank you very much. If you could just join with me in thanking all the external speakers today and then run like the wind.